Welcome to the Intro to Crypto Track. My name is Jim Friend. I'm a managing director for a company called Changing Our World, and we provide fundraising services to church organizations, nonprofits of all shapes and sizes around the country. I'm based in the Diocese of Allentown, just an hour north of here, where I'm a candidate uh, for the permanent diaconate in my fifth year of formation. Um, thank you. <laughs> so Deacon Rich and I have bonded a little bit over that before our, um, oh, thanks, Brian. A little bit on that, a little bit before our, um, our session here today. Um, I also am a, I have a podcast called Advancing Our Church. You can find it at advancingourchurch.com where we talk about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and development. And then lastly, my wife and I have a prayer ministry called Kristen's Crosses. It's on YouTube where we pray the rosary and we offer uh, reflections each day. We have 75,000 subscribers and last month we hit 2 million views in one month. So praise God. Uh, a lot of folks are, are using that service and, uh, and praying with us each day. I have the, uh, the distinct honor, as I said, of, uh, of introducing all of our speakers for the Intro to Crypto track. Um, by the way, are we having fun? Or are you guys learning a lot? What do you think of the session so far? Good? Excellent. All right. We're going to keep the energy up, and we're going to talk about blockchain today. And really, over the past 40 years, there's been few technologies that have the potential to impact our world as much as the blockchain. And we have an expert on blockchain today in the person of Deacon Rich Napoli. I'm going to offer a little introduction, and then we'll get started with the presentation. Deacon Rich Napoli, he has been in the software business for over 40 years and recently retired as the CEO of Relevance Incorporated, a 1,200-person software engineering firm that builds digital products for Fortune 500 firms and software companies. Since joining Relevance in 2010, Deacon Rich helped the company grow to over 1,300% and earned it a spot on Inc. Magazine's list of the fastest growing companies in America for three consecutive years. In 2014, he won CEO of the Year awards from Smart CEO Magazine and from the New Jersey Technology Council. Prior to joining Relevance, Deacon Rich held executive positions for five different software companies, including two that grew and sold to Oracle and State Street. He has served on a variety of boards in the past, including the Philadelphia chapter of Legatus and Holy Spirit Radio, where he also hosted a radio show. He's currently serving on the boards of Health Standards Organization in Canada and the Bush School of Business at Catholic University of America. He has a BS in computer, computer science from Stony Brook University, an MBA in finance from New York University. He's a regular speaker on the practical use of advanced technologies. For three years, he hosted a weekly radio show, Blockchain Radio. He has been married for 41 years to his wonderful wife, Janet. The couple has three children and six grandchildren. He was ordained a deacon in 2011 in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, and recently they moved to the Diocese of Arlington. Please welcome Deacon Rich Napoli. Thank you, Jim. That was way too long. <laughs> I don't even remember half that stuff I did. Well, thank you all for, uh, for being here. And uh, before I just uh, start, uh, you know, the, the concept of Catholic crypto and, and blockchain in the Catholic space, when uh, Matt called me like eight months ago and said, I want you to, you, you know, I'm talking about this Catholic crypto conference. I thought he was joking. You know, he said most people thought it was interesting. I thought he was crazy. Uh, but I did, uh, I was amazed that, you know, here I am, I'm in the technology business. I, had, I was on blockchain radio, as you said, and doing all kinds of things. And I'm a Catholic deacon. And here's a conference that puts my two worlds uh, together on one page. It's, I, I said, of course I'm going to do it. It's, it's, it's custom made for me, you know. But uh, uh, I do want to talk about blockchain. I'm going to take you through some of the basics, uh, just for those that are just really starting out. Don't, uh, you know, now you don't have to be technologically based uh, to understand this. Uh, but I want to give you a sense of what it is and the power it can have. Uh, I've been, in, as I mentioned, I've been in the software game a long time, uh, 40, almost 45 years now. And um, this is one of the most, and I've seen lots of technologies come and go. Uh, every three years there's something new that looks like it's going to change the world and it kind of fizzles and, or just gets you know, some mild attention. This is probably, other than the internet itself, is probably one of the biggest technologies I've seen and the potential for it to just transform so much of, of technology and information uh, going forward. So I want to give you a little basics to it, what it is and, and why we're focused on it. And uh, 
it's the technology that underpins cryptocurrencies, right? So we're, I'm not going to talk that much about cryptocurrencies today because uh, you're going to hear a lot of it elsewhere. But understand that blockchain is the technology underpinning cryptocurrencies. So think of it like uh, you have a car. There's lots of different cars. Uh, the engine in the car is what's making the car go. So the engine we're going to be talking about is blockchain. Yeah, crypto is just one of the many cars or boats or planes that could, that could be run by that engine. All right. Unfortunately, this screen is way smaller than I thought it was going to be. So this is going to wind up being my notes uh, rather than something you'd be able to read. Uh, this is just a little joke, uh, you know, about the, the, the hype that's around blockchain. Uh, just where should we focus? It's, we should focus on blockchain. It's going to change everything. Everybody's talking about it. The potential applications are endless. We don't want to get left behind. And what exactly is blockchain? And the guy says, well, and artificial intelligence, too. It's just, you know, there's so much around it, but not everybody necessarily understands what it is. Lots of hype, as I said. You can't, you're not going to be able to read this. So I get, this is my notes. As big as the internet. It's going to eliminate all job, clerical jobs. It's going to eliminate the need for lawyers. That's, that's not so bad. Uh, uh, it's going to eliminate the need for cash. Uh, it's just for criminals. Uh, it can't be hacked. It will be hacked. All kinds of, all kinds of hype. But there's also a lot of hope around blockchain, and that's what uh, you know, Matt was asking us to approach uh, everything with hope. And there's a lot of hope here. This is a, a quote from Gina Romente, the former chairman of IBM. And she said, blockchain, blockchain will do for transactions what the internet did for information. So it's a, it's, it can be a fundamental rewiring of the way we do transactions across the world. And that's part of the hope of this, is that it can really uh, create a system of digital trust between unrelated parties. Right now, if you want to do a transaction in India or in, or in uh, you know, uh, Philippines, you have to have an intermediary to, to, that you know and that the other party knows so that you can transact. This potentially could eliminate that. It'll simplify whole industries by reducing middlemen. And this is where it gets to some of the hope, too, that it will allow for greater interaction of marginalized people throughout the, the, uh, throughout the world. In terms of my views, obviously, I said the Catholic and blockchain, I thought it was a joke. Uh, but I'm so glad we're here today because we need to be talking about what is this technology. Yes, as most technologies are, it's morally neutral. It's not good or bad. But it can be used for lots of different ways. How do we, as Catholics, need to understand it, and how can we to identify good uses for it and to identify its potential misuse and, uh, and put it to work for God and church. All right, I'm going to use an analogy here that I'm going to refer to throughout the talk that I think uh, people can relate to. Uh, it has nothing to do with technology, but it's something we're going to, everyone has seen, right? You've all seen a tree stump, uh, and you've all seen the rings, right, around uh, the tree stump. And if you remember back in your biology class, the, tree, the rings represented one year of growth of the tree, right? So this was the very first year, and as, it, as the tree aged, the, the rings kept getting extended out, right? Always added on the end, at the outside of the, of the tree. And you can tell a lot when you look at this tree. Uh, you can tell how old it is. You can count the rings. You can see how old it is. You can see uh, if, the, if the rings were far apart. You knew that was a particularly rainy season because it got more water. If the, if, the, if the rings are pretty close, that was a dry season. You can tell if there was a forest fire, maybe there's some charring in the, on, the, on the bark. So you can tell a lot by looking at this, at this tree stump. And I'm going to use this tree stump as an analogy for blockchain, believe it or not. Let's go through it. I'm going to use, address some terms that you're going to hear used a lot in blockchain and, and crypto and everything else. The notion of immutability. So what does immutability mean for a tree stump? <laughs> it means... I can't go in and change the rings, right? If, if you know, the rings are there, I can look at them, but I can't go in and carve out one middle ring and say, this, this year didn't happen, because you'd leave a big hole there, right? And everyone could see that there, I did something to it. So I can't change the rings. They're there. Uh, transparent, everybody can see them. Secure, and I, I, I use this in the secular world, but I can, I can be a little stronger than to say only Mother Nature can add the rings. Only God can add rings, right? I can't add a ring. I can't make a tree grow 
uh, a new ring on it instantaneously. Only Mother Nature and God can, can add rings. So it's secure. Only privileged uh, people can add, the, add rings. It's distributed. This is a little bit of a stretch in this analogy, but it's distributed in the sense that if, if, if this was a tree standing right here in a forest, all the trees are right around it, assuming they were all planted at the same time, assuming they're all the same kind of tree. If you cut them apart, they'd all pretty much have exactly the same rings patterns because they have all would have experienced the same dry seasons, rainy seasons. They all would have experienced the same fire. Maybe the charring would be a little bit different, but you, know, you, you, you could easily tell from any tree in its immediate vicinity what happened in that forest. So that's what, and that's a key concept we're going to come back to with, with blockchain. It's distributed. It, there's not just one source of the data. It's, it's everywhere. And then this notion of a ledger. So uh, think of like, a, how many of you, I mean, uh, you all probably had some kind of accounting classes back in the day. And you all had ledgers, T ledgers, and you had debits and credits, and you kept adding down at the bottom. And you never went back and changed an old record, but if you made a mistake, you entered a cor correcting entry. Same with here. Even Mother Nature can only add rings on the outside. Right? Yeah, I can add. She can add new rings, but she can't go back and change existing rings. And it's, you're just constantly adding at the end of, the, of this tree stump. So keep those terms in mind, because now we're going to switch to, to how does, what do those terms mean inside of what's, what a blockchain is. So what is blockchain? It, it, first of all, it's not a thing. It's a software concept, right? It doesn't exist on its own. It's, it's an idea that has to be implemented in code. Somebody has to write code to make the blockchain exist. It was first theorized in the 1990s, um, long before uh, uh, the first Bitcoin. But it, was, it, was a, it was a theoretical paper. And then uh, the, the uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, whoever he is or she is, uh, you know, published a paper, I can, 2008, I think, right as the, the Great Recession was happening and, and sort of the challenges, you know, with Lehman Brothers blowing up and then the challenges of what, what's currency and how, how do I protect myself from loss? So he came up with this idea of Bitcoin. The first Bitcoin was traded, I think, January 12, 2009, and uh, uh, it's grown quite a bit since then, as you can imagine. As I said, block, Bitcoin is built on blockchain, but Bitcoin is not blockchain. A lot of people kind of conflate those two and think they're the same thing. <clears throat> it's like saying the engine is the car. It's not. It's the engine is the engine. The car uses the engine to, to, to move. Uh, at the end of the day, as somebody I was talking to, the gentleman in the back there, uh, Cosmos, uh, you know, blockchain is a store of records. It's a database. At the end of the day, guys, it's just a database. It's, it's that you could have, you know, a database being something you would store on your, your own computer, maybe your, your, your spreadsheet, uh, a list of names and addresses in your contact list. That's a database. Blockchain is just another database. But it has some unique characteristics, the ones we just talked about. It's immutable. I'm going to spend a little more time on what that means. But it, you write once. You can only append to, at the end. You can't change what's been already re recorded. It's transparent, meaning everyone that has permission to look at that blockchain can see all the transactions that happened. Not necessarily that you did the transaction, but they can tell that the transactions happened. It's secure. Think of like, the, like Mother Nature can only write at the end. Only those that are, that it's cryptographically secure, and that's why it's called uh, you know, cryptocurrencies. The cryptography is used to, to, to you know, uh, make the records not easy to read unless you have the access to them. Uh, it's distributed, just like the tree is in the forest, uh, because this is one of the key differentiators. I'm going to focus on distributed and immutable a bit. But distributed meaning, unlike the database on your PC or unlike the database in your office or in your, in your, you know, your corporate data center, it's not just stored once. It's, not, it's, it's replicated and stored with everybody that's participating on the blockchain has a copy of every transaction that ever happened on that blockchain. And the last thing is it's a ledger. As I said, it's only, you can only append to the end of the, of the chain. And the way, the way blockchain comes, the term comes in, the data that you're trying to add to this da database is aggregated into a block. You get a block of transactions, and it's appended at the end of the chain of records. So that's where you get blockchain. Uh, but it's a database. It's data. It's computer data that's, that's 
stored in a unique way and protected and secured in a unique way. And that's what makes blockchain a little different. I'm going to show you all the different ways it can be different, but I wanted to just di dive a little deeper on what those, two of those characteristics anyway. Distributed, meaning, as I said, there isn't just one copy of the data. Everybody that's participating in the blockchain has a copy of their data up to that last second. You know, the, and uh, they all see the same data. It's a network of connected servers, all, and they all agree on the rules and processes. I remember I mentioned that blockchain is a concept that has to be implemented in software. So everybody, that every server here has that copy of software and they're executing. They've all agreed that that's the rules they're going to abide by and they're going to all use the same software to conduct their transactions on the blockchain. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's an industry term we use, peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning it's no one node is in charge. There isn't one central node that everyone's copying from. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. Kind of like, uh, that's, you know, uh, I can't even remember now so long ago, but some of the old peer-to-peer -peer, uh, music sharing uh, uh, tools back in the day. No one's in charge. Everybody can see each other. Everybody can replicate. They all contain the same information. And here's a key thing is, when you're going to see this a little bit more, as someone proposes a new block to be copied around, there's a validation process. And you hear these terms. We'll talk about a bit. In a proof, of, proof of work, proof of stake. Uh, proof of action, proof of, there's all kinds of different proof systems, consensus mechanisms, uh, consensus mechanisms they call it, but ways to, that these, this group of individuals can reach a consensus that the next transaction that's being proposed is actually valid and should be added to the end of the chain. And <clears throat> that's one of the things that makes this uh, more secure than a typical centralized database. It doesn't, have, it doesn't, there's no one rogue actor that can operate and change the data um, to make it uh, something different. Everyone, more than 50%, 51% of the nodes have to agree that the next proposed transaction is actually valid and will be added to the end of the chain. And then once accepted, all the nodes, once that, that validation is done, all the nodes are updated with the next new block of, of data. All right, the, the other one I want to talk about a little bit is immutability. So. The fact is, as I mentioned to Cosmo as well, no data on any database is, is immutable. I can go in and change it. But, but the key thing here is, if I do, everyone's going to know that I changed my copy of it, and they're going to see that it's wrong and, and reject it. And I'll show you why. So here's a, I'm going to do a very simple example of a hash, which is a, a mathematical process to take a string of characters a string of data and convert it down to a single unique number. Now, I'm not going to be able to do a unique number here because otherwise it would be too complicated. But let's we'll do something. I take my name. So that, and, oh, I'm sorry. So here's the letters of the alphabet. And I've assigned each letter of the alphabet a number, right? 1 to 26. And this is not you know, the way this really works. But just to give you an idea. So my name, R-I-C-H, Rich. Take the letter. So R is 18. I is 9. C is 3, H is 8, and that's a block. It's a block of data. We're going to call that a block in this example. And you add those together, and that's now 38. Now, that's not a unique number, but in, in the hashing world, the there's a very complicated algorithm that guarantees that that number is unique. OK, so there's a block. It's got down. It's, all the data in that block has been smushed down to a single number, a unique number that anyone else can validate that that number is right. Um, but here's what happens. So now let's go, yeah, that's the first block now. There's the second block is my last name, Napoli. Again, taking all the letters and the numbers assigned to them, it has another number, 67. We're going to append that to the blockchain. And now there's a new number, right? 67 plus 38 is 105. So that number is stored as well at the end of the, or I actually think it's part of the header of that block, that the final number, the last node of the chain, has a value of 105. And everybody on the network knows that. Everybody, all those distributed ledger, all those distributed nodes, they all have that number. So now what happens? So I said, I can change the data. I'm going to go back and change my name here from Mitch, uh, Rich to Mitch. If I do that, what happens? the number changes, right? So it was 105, now it's 120 because these are different letters and more letters. So this, this value changed. 
and this value changed. <clears throat> and imagine now if this was, you know, replicated, this was the, the, you know, the 50th node and I changed the first node, it would ripple through all the numbers would be different down the line. So that all the other nodes that have the original version I have of 30, whatever I had there, 35, um, would see that and say, wait a minute, dude, you changed something. We're going we're gonna to knock you out of the box. We're not going to accept that transaction because we don't have those numbers on our version of the database. So that's why it's, 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 it, they say it's immutable. I mean, technically, again, it's data on a server, data on a, on, a, on a disk. I can change data on a disk. But if I do, I'm only changing my data, and everyone else will see that I changed my data. It's kind of like what I mentioned about the tree rings. If I went and carved out the tree ring, you know, uh, and, and try to pretend that it didn't happen, everyone would say, no, I can see you change it. And, and my tree rings don't have that cut out. Uh, therefore, we're going to, you know, you, you did something wrong. So that's what it means to be uh, immutable. Uh, it, it's not, it's almost it's like a self-healing kind of a thing. Yes, I could change things, but I can't change the validation process and the consensus around the entire network. All right, so I'm going to stop there and, and just focus now. I mean, that's about as much tech as we're going to talk about in terms of what blockchain is. You'll get a better sense of what it is when I give you examples of how it's being used. Uh, and I, almost none of my examples here are cryptocurrency examples, so I apologize. But I think the value of blockchain is infinitely larger than whatever we're talking about in cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies is just the, the use case that, that made it popular, but there are a thousand good use cases for blockchain, at least. All right, here's a way to make it make, it make sense again, uh, especially for how many people are my vintage? Hmm, some of you, yeah. Uh, Remember balancing a checkbook? Um, the idea that, uh, I don't think anybody, who balances a checkbook anymore? Anybody? Nobody, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> you must be an accountant. <laughs> but the idea was, you know, I record, I, I write checks, and, and I would have to record it in my checkbook to make sure I remembered that I, that I, that I wrote those checks. Uh, and that's a my ledger. That's my store. That's my database, if you will, of, of activity. Meanwhile, the bank is recording transactions as well. Not only those checks, but my uh, payroll deposits, my transfers, ATM fees, and so on. And that's affecting my balance. Now, who's right? right? Well, that's what the reconciliation process would be. You had to, because there were two versions of the truth, you had to sit down and balance your checkbook. You had to go back and say, yes, the, he's right, the bank is right on this one, or the bank is wrong on this one, and reconcile. And you have to match up to resolve discrepancies. But imagine if both of us wrote to a common ledger where there was one version of the truth. Any time either the bank or I created uh, a transaction, it got recorded on the same set of data, on the same ledger, on the same blockchain. Then there would be no reconciliation needed, right? We would both agree on the truth. There's only one way those records can be added, and it would just eliminate that uh, discrepancy. A better example, I think, is more real example is Again, uh, as you get older, this becomes more of a problem. Uh, every time you go to a new doctor, what do you have to do? What's the first thing they make you do? You spend about 15, 20 minutes filling out you know, your complete medical history of every test you had, every medication you took, every diagnosis you've had, every surgery you've had. And as you get older, that gets hard to remember, right? It's, it's like, gee, I don't know what I did, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, and yet, not knowing that could be impactful for the, for the doctor that's caring for you, right? If they don't know that you had some surgery, that you took your appendix out, they could be looking for appendicitis or something. So um, uh, what if, though, you, again, there was a common ledger that you controlled as, a, as the patient, so at the time of your birth, theoretically, you know, your, your parents had your, had your blockchain record set up, and every time a doctor prescribed the medicine, or took its test, took an x-ray, uh, did a procedure on you, that you gave that doctor permission to append to your blockchain of what, what, record, what activity, health rec activity you had done to you. And then no matter where you were in the world, no matter what country you were in, you would never have to fill out that form again. You would give the doctor permission to look at your blockchain of all your transactions, all your medical history. Again, one source, right? You know, how many times, I'm just dealing with this now, we just moved from Pennsylvania to, 
to, uh, to outside the DC area. And the DC area knows nothing of who I am. Or my, usually my wife, is, uh, she has cystic fibrosis. So, um, you know, she has a lot of medical history and all that, you know, has to be airlifted kind of uh, into, the new, uh, into the new hospital system. So you can see now, you're starting to see, gee, if, if you really could have an immutable distributed database of your, of your health records that was secure, then, then that problem goes away for you. Another one in my business, uh, I used to work a lot with the Wall Street firms. I worked at State Street for a number of years. I'm going to sell 100 shares of, of IBM stock to Kevin. Kevin, right? Yeah. <coughs> um, it should be just, you know, here, here's the money, here's the shares, and we're done. There's actually like eight counterparties to that transaction. There's me, there's me and Kevin, there's our brokers, there's our, the, the custodians, uh, which are the people that are they're, they're, they're like State Street and Bank of New York that actually hold your stocks and bonds and your cash. There's clearing houses, there's market makers. The, all of them have the same, hopefully the same record of, the, of activity that, that, that Kevin and I did. Invariably though, there's mistakes. And that's where there's a, a very complicated reconciliation process. And that's why you can't get your stocks recorded uh, the day you transpire them, right? You have to wait till all this reconciliation happens. Well, what if, instead of having eight versions of the truth, you had one version of the truth? What if all those players actually were writing to a common ledger in a secure way, in a mutable way, the record was posted once, and everybody had access to it? There would be no reconciliation. You could record transactions instantaneously. And believe me, Wall Street is working on this, the DTCC is actively building and testing this notion of a, of a blockchain. Because it would save the Wall Street industry hundreds of millions of dollars in, in clerical fees to, to execute this. OK, so you're starting to see maybe you know, the potential use of this, the power of this beyond even uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. Types of blockchains, I'm going to go through a few definitions here just again to get you uh, familiarized with uh, what you're, um, you'll be hearing the rest of the day. So when you talk about uh, 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 Bitcoin and some of the Ethereum uh, currencies and so on, those are on a public blockchain, which means that anybody can participate, anybody can read, anybody can write, if they have enough sort of uh, skin in the game. And there's different ways they can do that. But you know, that's the proof of work, proof of stake stuff I'll come back to. Most of the real use cases that exist today of blockchain outside of the cryptocurrencies are private blockchains. Uh, uh, I forget which speaker it was, uh, mentioned uh, Walmart. Uh, Walmart built a private blockchain for all its vendors and all its farmers and shippers and store clerks and so on that uh, uh, you have to be invited to join and then you can participate in ad transactions along the way. And then there's, a, there's sort of a hybrid between those two, a consortium of public and private where it's controlled who gets in, and they give you what, you what privileges you have, but then you're free to read and write as you see fit. All right, this is the toughest slide, and uh, it's just a bunch of definitions that you can't read from there, so I'll, I will read them off. So this notion of a consensus mechanism, proof of work, proof of stake, you hear these terms used a lot, and as I said, there's about 10 different consensus mechanisms that are used on different blockchains. There's no one blockchain. There's millions of blockchains, or thousands of blockchains, maybe. But the proof uh, is a way, is a method to prove that the participant on the network is, can be trusted, especially in a public blockchain. So uh, in the Bitcoin world, proof of work says, uh, to show me that you have skin in the game, I'm going to make you do an incredibly complex mathematical calculation that takes super large computers like 10 minutes to calculate. To show me that you're serious enough, that you've invested enough cash to actually build this big database, uh, this big uh, server that can process that calculation. It's typically something involving prime numbers and uh, you know, calculating prime numbers, things like that. Uh, but anyway, and then proof of stake is the other one. The proof of stake is uh, showing me that you have enough uh, uh, currency, if you will, or stake in the game that you're not likely to want to sabotage things because you lose more than anyone else does. So a proof of stake says, yeah, I've already got a gazillion bitcoins. I'm not going to go trash the entire Bitcoin network because I lose more than anybody. So proof of stake is a way of showing me that you have skin in the game. Smart, I'm going to come back to this a bit, so I won't talk too much about it, but a smart contract is uh, it's a digital contract stored on the blockchain that can be referenced by both parties. 
cryptocurrency, <laughs> there's a whole conference there to explain this to you, but essentially any digital currency created and stored on the blockchain, uh, you heard of Bitcoin, Dogecoin, uh, you know, Ether, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, cryptocurrencies. DeFi, decentralized finance, is taking the concept of, of, of uh, blockchain and applying it to the financial world, saying, why do we need banks? Not that we would ever get that far, but the notion is that if I, want to, if I uh, have money that I want to get uh, invested or I want to lend to someone, I give it to the bank, and they, they give me, you know, 3 4% interest, and they turn around and lend the money out to Kevin at 9% interest, and they take, the, they, take the, they take the float there between the two. What if I could lend money directly to Kevin in a secure way that uh, was immutable and trusted, and everyone could see the transactions were all out there? Um, so that's what decentralized uh, uh, finance is about. There's lots of different Bitcoin platform, uh, blockchain platforms. Uh, Ethereum is one. Bitcoin is obviously its own uh, uh, platform. Hyperledger is uh, an open source platform uh, uh, used widely by IBM. And most of my, comp you know, I, my, my company, Relevance, you know, we build a lot of blockchain systems for our customers. Most times they use Hyperledger uh, because that is sort of an industrial strength version of blockchain. It's something IBM took and they took an open source and they just kind of put all the things around it that I as a data center, you know, IT guy, I want to see. I want to see scalability. I want to see reliability. I want to see fault tolerance. All the things I want to see in a mainframe, not mainframe, but a main, you know, a major league kind of the blockchain, they put into Hyperledger. NFTs, you can hear a lot. I'm going to talk about that more in a second. But it's a, uh, so NFT, uh, Explain the difference between fungible and non-fungible. If I owe Kevin $3 and I pull out $3 bills in my pocket, he doesn't really care which dollar bill I give him, right? They're, they're fungible. One dollar bill is as good as the other. Non-fungible is, is the opposite of that. It means where um, it's a unique uh, instrument, a unique uh, token that represents something unique in either the digital world or in the real world. Like in the most extreme case, I could have a, an NFT for my house that says I own this house, and here's my token that proves I own the house. That's an extreme example. Most of it's used, and you'll see in a minute, uh, in other ways. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper on two of those topics. Just again, we could spend days talking about all this stuff, and I probably am spending too much time already. Uh, but uh, smart contracts and non-fungible tokens. So I'm going to give you another analogy for thinking about a smart contract. So um, first of all, what is it? it it's a, it's a smart contract is a digital contract stored on the blockchain that defines the terms and conditions that Kevin and I agreed on for, for providing services and goods to each other. The simple way to think about it is think about a vending machine. All right? do you, when you go up to a vending machine, do you sign a contract that says, when I put in money, I, I'm expecting to get a product out? No, we all know that the contract is sort of embedded inside the machine. It says, I put money in, I make a selection, it gives me what I selected and gives me any change back, right? That's an implicit contract that's embedded in hardware and software inside the vending machine. Now take that and blow that up to something bigger. Imagine with a full contract, maybe I, I make, uh, in my example here, I make refrigerators and I'm selling them to Kevin. Um, and I have 100 refrigerators, I put them on the truck, I scan them in to say that they're now in shipment. Kevin gets it, he opens the truck, he scans it, makes sure they're the right things, that, and then makes sure there's a hundred of them. And as soon as he clicks on the last one that says he's received it, then because this, the contract is stored on the blockchain, it says, here's the price we agreed on, here's the terms, <clears throat> it's, it's this model for this price, and once he does, instantly money is changed. The contract executes the transaction to move the funds from, from, uh, from his account to my account. Now, you know, obviously, uh, and all the records are kept. We can always go back and look at the records. And sometimes there could be mistakes. And just like in a regular ledger, you append to the end of the ledger. You make a correcting entry. Oh, there's only 98, not 100. OK. We have, and we put an appending uh, uh, adjustment to that. But the contract is, is sort of permanent until you append the contract. But the contract is an agreed to digital version of, of, of what's in there. <laughs> Some of you know what this is, some of you don't. Uh, but NFTs, again, this notion of a non-fungible token, uh, they're proof of ownership of some kind of asset, either a digital asset. In this case, this is the Board uh, Ape Yacht Club, uh, which is a whole series of digital art. 
this particular one sold, I think, for uh, three or four million dollars. I don't get it. Uh, <laughs> I don't claim to get it. But, you know, because I, I didn't have to pay the guy to put it up here. I can copy it. I can show it. But only one person owns it. Ooh, five minutes left? Yikes. Oh, because we started late. Okay. Come on, I get a little time back, don't I? <laughs> all right, all right. Let me move on then. Uh, but it's a way to, to, uh, to store, uh, to record transactions, not only of digital art, you know, photo, music, tickets. Ticketmaster just crashed because of Taylor Swift, right? Um, uh, you could store all that on the blockchain as well uh, and record transactions. All right, use cases real quickly. Yeah, you've seen some of them. Real estate, a chain of custody is the main thing they talk about is how do I prove the provenance, as someone was mentioned before, provenance of an item that something that I, uh, that I bought was actually made by the person I thought it was. Uh, so you can track uh, real estate transactions, that's the classic one, uh, of making sure that uh, when you go to buy a new house, there's title insurance guys that go and check to see who owned the house before, make sure there's no liens. You could put all that on the blockchain. Logistics tracking, we talked about uh, Walmart doing that. Uh, food man well, that's food management there. Um, sale and leasing of goods, uh, maintenance records for cars. It would kind of eliminate the, the shyster uh, used car salesman saying the car is all fixed and so on. Think of it like Carfax, but on, on the blockchain. Uh, identity management, we're seeing this a lot. Uh, <clears throat> for healthcare workers, to prove that doctors are who they are, to prove that uh, uh, professors are who they are. Uh, automobiles, uh, banking and finance, we are is probably the, obviously seeing a lot of that, but uh, insurance companies being able to prove you have continuous coverage, that you would never <laughs> draft for coverage. All right, so how is it being used today? This is data is already two, three years old. Um, this Gardner, the last Gardner report on it before the COVID, uh, that there was over a thousand blockchain networks outside of the cryptocurrency world that were being used in Canada, US, Europe, and Asia. Uh, and it just, it, COVID has accelerated a lot of those uh, activity because things had to go digital faster than people thought they would need to. The biggest place that's grown today, supply chain tracking, we talked about the Walmart example, Providence uh, controlling, uh, uh, you know, identity, payments and settlements, of course, uh, oh, there's identity man, voting, how about voting? We talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, questionable uh, voting uh, records, you could put all that on the blockchain. In fact, some countries do that already. Um, loyalty and rewards, shared record keeping. I'll give you a great example of that. Uh, I'm going to buzz through these since I only have a few minutes left. My, I'm going to get the hook soon. But lots of places that are monitoring food supply chains. Um, governments, uh, this is the interesting one. Estonia, <coughs> you know, is a, it was a Soviet Union satellite country. And when they got liberated, they are very concerned that the Soviet Union could take them over again. So they basically digitized their entire country. Everything you wanted to know about Estonia, you could do right from here. You can become a citizen of Estonia from here. You can do your, apply your taxes. You can get for driver's licenses. You can uh, your social security numbers. Everything is on the blockchain uh, at the country-wide level. Finance, a uh, for example here. My friend is the president of Northern Trust. Uh, Bill, and he's a big tech guy and he's determined to build a blockchain use case and he built one for private equity management for capital calls, investments, divestments and distribution of private equity funds. Healthcare we talked about. Uh, drug users are using this for clinical trial uh, uh, medications to prevent fraud. I mean that's a huge business in, uh, in pharmaceuticals protecting fraud that the drug that I take isn't the real drug. Again blockchain you could store that all the way from the time you left the factory to the time you take it in your mouth. Uh, medical records, so Latin America, again, uh, they, they're kind of leapfrogging us all because they don't have good records. They went right to the blockchain. The Latin American Institute of Health Management has a new blockchain medical record system. All right, I'm going to go through, uh, obviously keep these in mind, these are new. They're not, they're pretty still early in the life of blockchain. And all blockchains require collaboration. It doesn't make any sense for you just to build a blockchain for yourself. That's a, that's a silly thing. You put it on your spreadsheet if it's just for you. But when you need to collaborate and you have a bunch of business partners that are sharing data, they each have currently have their own version of that data. There's multiple people updating the data at once. And you don't necessarily trust each other. You know, the, the, the food store 
doesn't necessarily trust the farmer. He hasn't even met the farmer. And yet, this helps me make sure that I can record uh, transactions in a trusted way. And common rules. All right, so last one I want to talk about, so back to the Catholic world. How do we use blockchain in the Catholic world? Well, that's what we're all here to talk about. I'm going to give you my, I spent like two minutes thinking about this. But how about sacramental records? How about you went to go get married and you had to get your baptism certificate and your confirmation certificate? You know, and you find out, it's, it, as, you, as you know probably, all those records are stored wherever you were baptized. So, Mom, where was I baptized? <laughs> you know, and, and you've got to go find the, the parish and you've got to go contact them and they've got to ship you the records. Put all that on the blockchain. And also, if they have a fire, the whole thing is wiped out, and which has happened sometimes. Put it on the blockchain, control it, so that everyone, every parish in the world could see your records when you were baptized, married, confirmed, uh, ordained, whatever. How about a Vatican currency? Uh, the Vatican's often want to give and donate money to poor countries, but they know that if they go through the chain of command in those countries, the money will never get to the people in need. Create a currency that backed by the Vatican government, and, and you can, in, again, you can do transactions directly with them. How about priestly records? Uh, not only for you know, seminary courses, assignments, and certificates, how about for issues? We have the whole scandal, right? You know, and, and how many times do we hear that a priest was, was accused in one parish and got moved somewhere else and nobody knew about it? Put it on the blockchain, and then, and then everyone could see that. And this is, a, this is somewhat humorous, but uh, uh, relics, uh, you know, you can't buy and sell them, but how do you know they're real? Uh, how do you know it's a real, authentic relic of a saint? Or the true cross, it must be what you know, they said, if you ever assembled all the pieces of the true cross, it'd be like 10 crosses together. But, you know, you could use that, again, to prove the provenance. Because now a relic comes with a piece of paper that says it's from this saint, but you could put that on there. Anyway, that's just a few ideas. I'm going to wrap up here and just say, now you know a little bit more, and I'm going to take questions in a second, but uh, blockchain is a distributed ledger. You hear that a lot, DLT, distributed ledger technology. It's a ledger that's distributed, stored on multiple computers. It's very secure, can store data, contracts, tokens, currencies, and can be used for many good purposes and a few bad ones, but that's what we're here for. It's up for us to determine how do we put this to work and to increase God's kingdom. I started with two or three ideas. There's a million ways we could potentially use this. Let's start that conversation about what it could look like. And that's it. Thank you very much. And I'll take some questions. Thank <laughs> you.